We are not a sports betting site. Rather, we are a fantasy sports site. One that tests your sports acumen. But whatever you call it, we make millions off your expertise. Hi everyone, this is Will O'Toole welcoming you to another edition of Park Ridge Sports History. This week, I'd like to turn our attention, of course, to the Mets. And uh, what a, uh, an unfortunate segue to the Mets, of course, is with the recent passing of John Stearns, age 71, from uh, apparently pancreatic cancer. Uh, I saw uh, pictures of uh, John Stearns just recently, and it looked like the cancer was really taking a toll on him. And it was really just a shame because as I was reviewing his statistics, he would have been a better ball player today. And of course, he did play for those terrible Met teams in the late 70s and early 80s that just couldn't get out of their way. Uh, those were teams that had really mediocre pitching. Guys who I, I really thought were going to be better pitchers and, of course, better players. They had people like Pat Zachary, Craig Swan, who really never uh, fulfilled their quote-unquote potential. In fact, if anything, the Mets probably hung on to those players, those particular pitchers, hoping they would really somehow uh, find their way. And probably because they didn't want to get burnt by another Nolan Ryan type of uh, situation by via trade or just letting them go uh, free agency. But I just wanted to review a little bit about Stearns' career because I couldn't believe when I saw this. He was a four-time All-Star. Now, All-Stars, yes, for better or worse, they are, uh, everyone has to have at least one member uh, being represented at the All-Star game each year. I'm actually for that for a number of reasons. One is you can be a really good player on a terrible team. And you can also, just the opposite, really not be a good player, but because you're playing with, for such a good team, your stats look much better. And sometimes we take those players over more deserving players. For instance, Stearns. And I, I think I've even made this point uh, one time with, with George Brett, 85. I always felt he should have been the MVP. Of course, the Royals went and won the World Series that year. And uh, the Royals had a pitiful offense. And of course, it was one of the years that the Yankees had an MVP over the last 30 or 40 with Don Mattingly. But Mattingly was playing with a highly high octane charged um, offense with Dave Winfield hitting behind him. And I, I always like to do the point of, well, what was the percentage of offense that Mattingly produced? And what was the percentage of offense that uh, Brett produced? I'm pretty sure, look, you can look it up. I took their RBIs and runs, and I had a little bit of uh, RBIs and runs scored, did a little bit of formula, but it came out that Brett was really responsible for about 18 19% of the total team offense, and meanwhile, Mattingly was about 15 or 16. It was close, but I know that Brett was a little bit higher, and the reason why I would have given to Brett was the fact that the Royals do win the pennant. They did win, first of all, they won the American League West, where the Yankees were probably around second or third place, but they were never really um, involved in a pennant race. This is not to take anything away from Mattingly's year. I'm just talking about the award is not best player, <clears throat> which is probably Mattingly would have won that hands down in 85 in the American League. It's talking about most valuable player. And I always thought that Brett, uh, be as it may, he didn't win. He was MVP in 1980 because he was not just the MVP. He was the best player in the American League in 1980. But I always thought that Brett perhaps should have been given a better look as opposed to Manning. They were gaudy stats. Don't misunderstand. Brett's were more important, if you know what I mean. Anyway, getting back to Stearns, and I want to keep everything almost all Mets this week because I've been promising and promising to give my – quote-unquote, 
first of all, there's no expert here. It's just my looking at, at the teams and trying to get uh, a pretty good understanding of, of how the Mets will do, let's say, in postseason, which I think they'll make. Anyway, I'm looking at Stearns, and really, he was not – he would have been a very good player now. Not that he wasn't looked at as a good player then, but some of the things he did, I, um, he had some speed when I was, and I do remember this, but just to reinforce it, he was a two-star sport at the University of Colorado. In fact, he was from Colorado, played both football and baseball, was a defensive back uh, with the Buffaloes, but chose baseball, was originally selected or originally played with the Philadelphia Phillies. In fact, his first hit was registered as a Philly, and he got that off Mike Torres of the Montreal Expos back in 1974. He's involved in that big trade when the Mets, over the winter of 74, because they were mired, they finished, I think, 71 and 91. They just needed to clean house. That's what the general uh, manager in the front office felt. They got rid of McGraw. Of course, you got to believe from the year before. They got rid of a number of other players and took on Stearns. He was one of the players that they got along with Del Unser. Unser eventually does work his way back to Philly and along with McGraw helps that Philly team win their first World Series in 80. That being said, I was looking uh, at his stats. He had uh, two at-bats with the Phillies in 1974, got one base hit off Mike Torres. Now, here was the problem. Stearns was a utility-type player, and it seemed like back in the 80s, the Mets got a lot of uh, utility players. They were jack-of-all-trades, masters of none. Together with him and, let's say, Joel Youngblood, they had players who were good in terms of this. They were probably more athlete than baseball player. So Joel Youngblood could play all infield positions plus the outfield, and he did in his major league career. We've talked about Joel Youngblood. Same thing with Stearns. He wanted to be a catcher. Well, Boone was blocking that, no pun intended, at uh, with the Phillies. And, of course, Boone was a good, actually a great defensive uh, catcher for the Phillies and the Angels. Bob Boone, that is. He was never going to play third base, although I was looking at some of his games with the Mets. He does play third, and of course he could play outfield. He was kind of like a Gary Carter that way. Again, if and I'll tell you this, basically in baseball, if you can play third in the outfield, obviously you can play first base. And that really makes you a valuable player. Stearns would probably be a better fit today. And again, not knocking him, he does make four all-star teams, albeit it was with, lack of a better word, the putrid Mets of the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, it was a team that was kind of a combination of, okay, we have these young players like Mazzilli. Let's surround them with veteran players. But those veteran players were not, they were just over the hill, really. Uh, they bring in Foster. Foster... Great player in his prime. I love them. MVP, 1977. But by the time he got to the Mets, he was really past his prime and really shouldn't have been playing for uh, a last place team. He would have probably been better acclimated and better suited for a pennant contender like the Phillies, like the Pirates, etc. Dave Kingman was on those teams. In fact, it was his, what, second go around with the Mets. Um, and we all know, actually, Kingman would be a star today because he's home runs or strikeouts. He would be a perfect DH. All things considered today, because when he came, he did draw a lot of walks, you know, in some seasons because there was no, they would just pitch around him because there was no one batting behind him to uh, really support him at all. Hit up. Jacked a lot of home runs. He would have been a perfect player for today's way that they play. And we'll get to that, too, with the recent uh, rulings by the commissioner, how they're going to change the game. Hopefully, hopefully it won't 
hurt the game. Uh, and maybe they'll rethink some of the things that they're doing. And, and we'll talk about that too. But Stearns in 1982, let me just see if I have a picture of John Stearns. I know I did. I have it on blue paper in recognition of his time with the Mets. Anyway, getting back to his athletic ability, he was a two-star athlete in a major college. That's saying something about an athlete's ability. He was a defensive back. He had some speed. With And I'm looking using a sports reference. He had 91 lifetime steals. Didn't have a good percentage. You know, he averaged over 24 doubles for four straight years, which is saying a lot because if you take a look at even the big hitters, many of them kind of give up the double and the home run becomes everything for them. Very rarely do you see a guy hit 30 home runs and 40 doubles in a season. All right. But for Stearns, he had 25, 24, 29, 25. Good power. Reasonably good power. Like I said, his first hit was off Mike Torres. Then he gets traded to the Mets. His first season with the Mets is 75. They don't have a bad season. They were over 500. But he played 59 games, hit three home runs, 10 RBIs, 189 batting average. It does improve to the point that once the Mets go downhill in 77, he is the New Yorker's only rep in uh, at Yankee Stadium in the 77 All-Star Game. He does get picked for the 79 All-Star Game at Olympic Stadium in Montreal. And again, in 80, uh, he is selected for the All-Star Game. I, excuse me, 79, they go to the Seattle Dome. And, and actually... He and Lee Mazzilli are there representing the Mets. One of the few times during that time period where the Mets had two representatives. And in the 80, uh, he goes to L.A. Uh, as a representative. And in his final year he, uh, as a selection, he's up at Olympic Stadium. Funny thing is, his best year, he was not selected for the All-Star Game, 1978. Um but anyway, had a pretty good season. Here's where I'm going with this. Played 143 games, 15 homers, mostly playing catcher, 73 RBIs, 25 steals. Sounds good. 13 caught stealing. So it's basically at about 60%. Hit 264. But here's the thing, and this is what, when I was looking at him, where he would have been really good. From 77, uh, in 1977, 78, he drew 77 walks and 70 walks, respectively. Then he drew 52. So he did have what I would consider a good uh, view of the strike zone, pretty good plate discipline. You know, he's put it this way. He's not Johnny Bench. He's not Carlton Fisk. He's not Mike Piazza with the stick. But he is a very serviceable player. You put him on a good team, Stearns, and he would have been very valuable for the number of things I said. Could play a number of positions for his speed, for his athleticism. Could catch, something a lot of guys aren't willing to do. Could hit. Uh, not a home run hitter, but definitely had some what we consider gap power. Had enough speed that he could get around the bases, okay, would steal a few bases, very helpful. And in fact, his last year with the Mets, uh, his last full season, I was looking at this when he hit a home run. Early in the year, the Mets were playing pretty good ball. I think they got up to about six games over 500. Now, it was early May, and I think there were four games over 500 by as late as uh, June 30th, maybe July. Then everything fell off. You know, the wheels came apart. During that time, Stearns was a valuable player on that Met uh, roster. In fact, he played, uh, he was usually hitting second in the order, and he had some games where he had three, four hits number of triples, etc. I'm not making him for Hall of Fame. 
I'm not saying that the Mets should retire his number. All I'm saying is this. He would have been a more uh, useful player today. And certainly had he not, it's like anybody else. If you play for a last place team, if he had just, and it's ironic because he did play in the great stage of New York City, but at a time when the Yankees were king. But I'm thinking of him, had he played for a team like the Cardinals, or like I said, a penny contender like the Expos, maybe he does become Carter's uh, backup during those late 70s, early 80s, and maybe more than just a backup where they say, we're going to put you at third, take over for Parrish, we're going to put you in the outfield. You can play for Cromarty or Valentine or maybe uh, uh, spell uh, those players in the corners, probably more in left than right, of course. Play first base. He just might have been a be better player and uh, better stats. So I just wanted to salute John Stearns because I always felt he was a good guy. He was really... I'm not saying he was symbolic of those Mets in the 80s or anything like that, but when you think of those terrible Met teams of the 70s, when they just couldn't get out of their way, unfortunately, you think of the Mazzillis, you do think of the Stearns as the young bloods, players that would have been better suited for pennant contenders. All right. Now, speaking of which, I held up this early cartoon about the sports betting sponsorship. I won't name any companies, uh, but it is one of those drastic, I, I would consider as a baseball fan for over 50 years, it's a drastic change. It's nothing new this year. It's been really um, coming to fruition over the last three, four years. And to me, I've just really seen the explosion of it really this year. And one, I'm not going to go on and criticize, but I think it is harmful to the game. However, I'm not going to get into all of that just, just yet. I'd really like to talk about the recent rulings by the commissioner. Two things that bother me. Well, three things that bother me. One is... The defense, the limiting of the alignment of the defense. So they can't shift. This is what's going to be imposed in baseball. Interestingly enough, the players were against this. They are going to limit the number of throws to first. Again, the players were against this. They are interested in increasing ever so slightly the size of the bases. And a couple other rules. Oh, Times, a uh, pitcher has a certain amount of time, and a batter has a certain amount of time. Actually, kind of agree with that. I have no problems with, buddy, get in to the box, swing the bat, get set. Stop playing with your gloves. Stop looking down. Stop stepping out. I understand it's all gamemanship, but it's slowing the game down. It's making two hour, 15 minute games that you could sit and be in bed by 1030. Now they, every game is a marathon that doesn't end until 1145. It seems, yeah, that's the old cranky man in me talking. What really bothers me is the fact that baseball is trying to end creativity and strategy among the managers. And that is by stating, I think one of the rules is you're going to have to have fielders in a certain jurisdiction or area rather than what we've seen. And it is, and I will state it is over shifting. Yes, there are players. Sometimes it seems like there's eight guys going down the left field line for a, a, a dead pull power hitter or a right, uh, a lefty batter comes up and everybody seems to be on the right field side. I get all that. And it is amazing that guys can throw out from short field on ground balls, hard hit ground balls, second to first, that normally would have been base hits. I get all that. What I don't want 
is this enforcement where now as a manager, you're taking away my creativity, my use of data, my strategy from the game by limiting what I can do in the field. And I've said before, and I guess I sound like a old codger here as I'm moving up there in age, you're being paid 25, 30 million dollars and you can't lay down a bunt. You can't hit the ball to left field. The batting averages are atrocious this year and over the past few years. Yeah, maybe home runs are up. I told you. I, I've said this before. It's like playing glorified wiffle ball in your backyard. I don't need that. It's how we used to play. In a limited space, you'd say walks, don't run out anything. You just take walks, strikeouts. If you feel the ball on one hop, it was an out, and home runs over a designated uh, barrier. Today, that's what baseball looks like. And here's really the beauty of the game has turned this way. I love all the, the data and the metrics part of it. Hey, you know what? I'm daring you to go to left field. And I have to be honest with you. I saw a recent article. I don't know what writer it was. It was probably from the Post who stated that one of the players who's all for this stated he lost eight hits with the overshifting. And we'll use their word, overshifting. Eight hits is really not a lot over the course of a season. However, maybe you could have gotten 16 bunt hits and maybe – change the whole strategy of the defensive alignment if they knew, hey, look, if I see everybody lined up on the right side, I'm just dropping a bunt. The other day I saw a nice hit by a Yankee. Can't remember who it was. I don't know whether it was an intentional or not, but they had the third baseman for Milwaukee who was playing over, right, basically short and third. They had the shortstop playing at second base, Keystone, and they had the second baseman in the, in the outfield. And he hit a ball between the third baseman and the second. Went through for a base hit. It was really a nice piece of hitting. That's what you should be doing. And here's my whole point. You're not going to change the behavior of the players by taking away the shift. You're not. If anything, you're probably going to just promote walks, strikeouts, and home runs instead of overall play. Number two. So I'm, I'm, I'll tell you this. Lou Boudreau must be rolling over his grave because he's the one who came up with the quote-unquote William Shift, which helped the Indians win the 1948 pennant and then the World Series. Actually, though, so much for the shift because Teddy Ballgame, Ted Williams, finished with over a 340 average, 343. 344. Still hit his home runs. Still pounded out his doubles. And even at the age of 40, was hitting 316 with 29 homers and 70 plus RBIs. Williams, yes. Stubborn. Great player. Hall of Famer. Once in a generation type player. But he refused to be psyched out by the shift. And if only other players would start to realize that. Make yourself into a more well-rounded hitter. Well, I'm really kind of aggravated by this. All right. Second thing is, I couldn't believe, <clears throat> I did hear this earlier, and I knew that they were going to limit the pickoffs. First of all, as an umpire, every once in a while, I couldn't stand when the kids threw pickoffs. It just slowed the game down. But, however, that being said, by limiting the number of pickoffs, all you're doing is promoting guys to take the base. You might as well just say this. If the guy's on first base, nobody's ever going to throw over or they're going to throw once and that's it. Or if they throw second, you might as well just give him the base. You might as well just give him second base because you know he's taken off. Even the slowest runners in the game are going to take off. They might as well just lead 88 feet. 
That was not thought out. You are ruining the game. You're ruining the strategy of the game. Notice they want to limit the number of pickoffs, but they let these runners come out with basically oven gloves. You ever see some of those? They're huge. They're twice the size of the normal hand. And that is accepted. And that is a huge advantage. That's an unnatural advantage. That's a man-made advantage. Some of those gloves come up, it seems like they're twice the size. And I get it. They're for protection. Or they don't have to be that big. All that does is give an advantage to the base runner. But that hasn't been quote unquote outlawed or banned. Instead, what we're doing, we're limiting the throws to first. Can you imagine Joe Morgan playing today or Lou Brock or Ricky Henderson? Man, they would feed off that. They'd probably have 200 steals. Baseball's got to think about that a little bit. Really, really think about it. So I guess I'm in a mean mood today about baseball because it's a game I love. And I feel that it's being destroyed by a number of rules when the commissioner of baseball should be saying, we're not, we are not going to limit defensive shifts. What we would like to promote is better all round hitters. I guess every once in a while I should on the show have an occasion to rant a little bit. Because I just love, I just don't want to see the game ruined. It's been ruined in my mind already with the DH. And the interesting thing about the DH with the defensive shifts, well, if it was put in for offense, then you shouldn't have to worry about defensive shifts, right? Because all this offense should be coming from that ninth player who's now batting for the pitcher. It's been ruined by, to me, interleague play. And I said earlier in another episode, what they should do is just blow the game up because you've ruined the all-star game with interleague play. Take it out of way. You had one team switch a division, actually two teams switch divisions. And uh, what they really should do is align these teams now based on their fan base, revenue, and their market. And then that way, teams can't tank it. They can't tank it. And they will probably keep some of their better players. If you're a Reds fan, you're looking for not next year. You're hoping like five, six years down the line, somewhere along the line, their picks for uh, for their team will somehow all come together and maybe win a, win a division, win a pennant, and maybe win a World Series for the first time in 35 years. Again, I've ranted enough. <laughs> anyway, I had promised in these last 10 minutes or 15 minutes, I'd like to talk about the Mets this year and compare them to um, the 69 and 86 Mets. I'm not going to include any of the other pennant winners like 73, 2015, simply because uh, they didn't win, and I'm trying to give um, not so much a ray of hope, just just comparing them. I was looking at the Mets 69, 86, and 2022 squad. And, of course, I've talked about war not to – by the way, with the war, I was looking for it again, and uh, basically – I think 95% of it seems to me subjective. Yeah, they put some numbers in, but it's still subjective. It almost is like, well, this is how I feel about the war guy. You know, this guy really was a better player than this guy and all the rest. And I've shown you probably the guy who most um, demonstrates my whole frustration and understanding, and that's Marcus Seaman over uh, between his year, his last year with Oakland, his first year with Toronto. Extremely similar stats. And yet, the stat with Oakland 
was a point and a half higher, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it is in terms of war calculations. So it's very, very frustrating. All right, I'm looking at the Mets, 69. Maybe I should have saved them. Just to give Mets some hope, they finished 100 wins, 62 losses. That year, the Mets <clears throat> were eight games ahead of the Cubs, who finished 92 and 70. They basically fell apart, the Cubs, and the Mets just got hot. Ready for this? The Mets, over August that year, they were incredible. Let me just see if I have it right here. Yeah. From August, September, and the one game in October, okay? But we'll keep it. The Mets went 45 and 18. That's a 625 percentage, which was higher than their final mark of 617. They just blew everybody out of the water. And here's the deal. I couldn't believe when I saw this. You know, there were only three teams in 1969 that were under 500 in the National League. It was San Diego, Montreal, and Atlanta. Now, San Diego and Montreal were new teams, expansion teams. The Mets, ready for this, went 24 and 6 against those teams. Interestingly enough, as I always like to say, the Mets lost the first game they played against Montreal opening day. But from there, they were thirteen. They would win thirteen of the next seventeen games against the Expo. I could. I was floored when I saw only three teams were under five hundred in the National League that year. The other team was um, Philadelphia, and the Mets were twelve and six against them. Basically, what the Mets did to win the division, and it wasn't well. First of all, Mets really had a great season. It was magical. It was miraculous, but the Mets flat out could beat anybody with the exception of the Houston Astros. The Mets lost 10 of 12 games to the Astros, and all you Mets fans know that. The Astros finished 81 and 81. They would have been 71 and 79 with, uh, if it hadn't been for the Mets, right? So um, the Astros... Had the Mets number, but the National League, ready for this? The Mets were 8-4 and four against the Western Division champ, Atlanta Braves, then went 3-0, and oh, swept them in the playoffs. So you're talking about 11 of 15 wins against that team. And, of course, that was a team loaded with Aaron and Cepeda. Okay? Uh, Aaron did get hurt a little bit there towards the end. Still think he finished with uh, 38. And uh, Cepeda who I've talked about in past shows, comparing him again with the war with Ernie Banks that year. Uh, had a really good, he had a 3.2 or 3.5 war and carried, um, he was a very valuable player for the Braves that year as they won the first Western Division Championship when baseball expanded, oh, not only expanded, but divided into two divisions. It's the first year. Chicago, the Mets won 10 of 18. Not bad. You always figure this against your rivals. If you go 500, it's almost expected. I, I really do believe that. If you're better than 500 against the team that's your equal, you're doing a good job. And the Mets did a great job in 1969 against the Cubs. Remember, they had the rally. They were eight down. They had the rally. Uh, the Cubs think I, many people believe that the Cubs – Thought they won the whole thing and they didn't take the Mets seriously. Remember the, the famous uh, Ron Santo clicking his heels and Gil Hodges real upset with that. All right. St. Louis. The Mets were 12 and 6. And I thought St. Louis finished under 500, but when I went back to the rest, they actually weren't that bad that year. And they were the world champions and the reigning National League pennant winners for the last two years, going 12 of 18 against Carlton and Gibson. And everybody knows about that 69 Met team when Swoboda hit the two home runs, the two two-run home runs, counted for four RBIs and beat Carlton 4-2 on a night that Carlton struck out 19 Mets. That kind of really encapsulates the Mets, 1969. Against the Giants with Willie, the two Willies, McCovey and Mays, they were 8-4. And, and, of course, We've talked about how great the Cubs uh, or the Giants were during the 60s. Uh, had some great players, just almost never got there with the 62 
uh, pennant, their only, uh, a, you know, true winning uh, during the 60s. L.A., I was surprised at this because the Mets have always struggled on the West Coast, but they were 8-4 and four against the Dodgers. Cincinnati, 6-6. Six and six. And, of course, what would happen with Cincinnati? Win the pennant the next year and become the National League team of the 70s. Two World Series, five pennants, etc. Um, so the Mets were 62 and 40 for a 608 winning percentage against the elite teams. And really, when you think about it, the two teams they had to beat, Atlanta and Chicago, and I'm going to count the playoffs as well with uh, the Braves, they were 21 and 12. It's a good mark. All right. Now, that year, here's why the Mets won in 69. And just keep this uh, in mind. <clears throat> Mets, like I said, were 162. Won by eight full games over the Cubs. Just blew them out of the water. The Mets, though, had the 10th best offense or the third worst offense, scoring 3.9 runs per game. Now, that includes runs and unearned runs as well, okay, baseball reference. That was 10th. The league average was 405. Why this is a big deal is that it's also an expansion year, and everybody has always felt expansion year, lack of pitching or dilution of pitching, there should be a, a spurring of offense. Not with the Mets, 3.9. The two teams behind them were the expansion teams, Montreal and San Diego, pretty wild. And then this. However, their defense, and I'm talking about defense because not their pitching, 3.34, which was second only to the Cardinals, 3.33. So basically, you can actually argue they were the best in terms of um, runs prevented per game at 3.34. They were winning every game by almost half a run, better than half a run, excuse me. Pretty good. The 86 Mets. Um, oh, and here's another thing I want you to think about. The Mets actually averaged, they drew 3.25 walks a game. And I know that, that walks are a big deal. Drawing three walks a game in 69, that, to me, that was very impressive in terms of, you know, how the game has changed. Why? Because the 2022 team, they are drawing only 3.1 walks per game. And the 86 team really was over 3.9. You know, it doesn't sound like a lot, four walks a game, but think about it. If you're the home team, you're drawing a walk every other inning. And we know that walks really do lead to runs and sometimes to big innings. And it just puts more pressure, one, on the defense. And – pushes up the pitch count on uh, the pitcher on the mound. The Met team of 86, they were the best offensive team in the nation in the league that year, 4.83. Now, where in context, that was a full almost 0.7 runs higher, almost a full run, 0.7, than the league average of 418. The Mets pitching, again, was second, 3.57. They were beat – guys, they were beating – all right, by one, a full one and one and a quarter runs better than their opponents every game. Good pitching that, great pitching that year, 3.57. Who did they trail? The Houston Astros, 3.51. Who they obviously would meet in the pennant that year, uh, for the pennant that year. 2022, right now, the Mets, um, they're averaging – 4.68 offense, really good right now. Second in pitching or run prevention, 3.73. The best, now this is going to be a bother, it's the L.A. Dodgers, 3.15. A full half run better than the Mets. That could come back uh, to haunt them. And in 86, I just want to do this before I go on. All right. Against the winning teams, the Mets in 86. Ready for this? 
the Mets were 78 and 30 against second division teams. Unbelievable winning percentage. But they were 30 and 24 against, ready? Combination of Houston, Cincy, San Francisco, and uh, San Francisco and Philadelphia. They were, there were only five teams who finished over 500 in the National League in 1986. 555 winning percentage. The Mets, of course, were 108 and 54, winning two thirds of their game. So you can see they were better than 700 against the crummy teams. That year, Pittsburgh, they won 17 of 18 games. Against Houston, they were 7 and 5. Cincy, 8 and 4. San Francisco, 7 and 5. And the only team they had a losing record against was the Philadelphia Phillies, 8 and 10. And the Mets of 2022, this is what you got to worry about, guys. Um, they were kind of taken aback. Uh, not as good as I thought. And they are right now 39 and 30 against winning teams, but they are 9 and 7 against Atlanta, 14 and 5 against Philly, 5 and 2 against St. Louis. Against the weaker opponents, the Mets, 52 and 25, playing better than 667 ball. Those are stats. Keep in mind pitching defense, offense, walks, and individual records against the good teams. I want to thank everybody for joining me again and allowing me to rant. And of course, Howard Fredericks, always a big part of the show. Until next week, this is Willow Tool. Thanking you again for joining me for Park Ridge Sports History. I'm